Thanks. Thank you very much, Derek. I'll get going so I don't lose any time and you haven't taken any of my time. It's a great thrill. Thank you very much for the invitation to take part um, in this, uh, this meeting. I'm lucky enough actually to be a fellow, I must admit, honorary fellow of this college. So it's very nice to have the opportunity also to, to talk here as well. Um, I uh, was a little bit of a loss um, when Derek sent me a note to talk in a short period about the prevention of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And I nearly uh, fainted at the burden, you know, for a 20-minute presentation. So I've done a little bit of manoeuvring around and I thought I might talk a little bit about a potpourri of the problem and let's see how we, we go. I think I should put up here the guy who actually got me into epidemiology, uh, the late Harry Keane, who was a wonderful person, probably known to many of you, and he certainly stimulated my um, interest in diabetes and epidemiology. And he was one of the first people, and I'll mention later on, he set up the multinational, WHO multinational study uh, on uh, cardiovascular disease and diabetes ooh, nearly 40 or 50 years ago. So he was way ahead of the game. But we'll come back to that a little bit later on. Um, I started actually sitting at Guy's Hospital over Christmas and no one ever comes to work in England around then. I picked up a Lancet and I read an article by a famous New Zealander, Ian Pryor, an epidemiologist mainly in cardiovascular disease, who was reporting high rates of diabetes in Polynesian populations within <coughs> New Zealand and in some of the Pacific Islands. And my mentor, Harry, uh, my mentor in Australia, Pinkerstaff, was actually uh, studying or looking after patients in a little island in, of called Nauru in the middle of the Pacific, 5,000 population, richest people per capita in the world as a result of phosphate mining, mainly being done by the British Phosphate Commission, but they were getting the royalties. And uh, I'd said to um, Pinkett's Taft, we need to go and survey there. And, and Nauru sits somewhere in the world in... Um, here we are. Sits somewhere in the Pacific, um, halfway between Australia and the United States. Um, and we did a survey there, and in that survey we describe the highest rate of diabetes in the world in a national population. It was higher than the Pima Indians. I mean, they weren't a nation per se in a, a sort of city sense. And you can see here the very high rates of diabetes. Look at these people, 55 and over. Over 50% of the population had diabetes. And our um, local paper... Um, ran a story on these, this discovery called A Western Killer Let Loose in Paradise, saying diabetes, possibly the greatest hidden killer in the world, has hit the South Pacific. This was in, um, actually, this report was, it came later, but it was, we surveyed there uh, in um, 1972. Uh, what the problem with this was that they put my photo there and I was identified as the Western killer. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that spoilt the story badly. Uh, I, I'm not going to give you hundreds of millions of figures about the number of people in the world with diabetes. The IDF figures are saying it's over 500 million, climbing up to a billion, so to speak, but we all know diabetes is a complicated disorder and these complications, um, each of them is a la leading single cause of you know, blindness, kidney failure, heart disease, etc. So we're talking about a very big problem now and it was based on the original Mauritius finding of that high prevalence diabetes that I predicted we were heading for a global epidemic of diabetes. Um, Reese, a couple of years ago, we actually studied various groups who were reporting on the rates of diabetes and the number of people. A, a study with George Alberti, Peter Bennett, 
myself, and we actually worked out that all the people, IDF, uh, the global burden of disease, were all significantly under uh, quoting the number of people with diabetes globally, and of course that also uh, hit the headlines at a certain point in time. The epidemic much bigger than we thought it was going to be. Well, I could stop the presentation here. Actually, Derek and myself, along with George Alberti and Yako Tumaleto, have been involved in an island um, in the Indian Ocean, Mauritius, with a high rate of diabetes in three different ethnic groups. And I was there only a couple of weeks ago, and this was the big sign that greeted us as we come out, came out of the airport. Afraid of diabetes, drink Maurice Bay tea. Now, we could finish there if that was really the story, but, but, but we can't. Um, preventing diabetes, again, just a very simple graphic point that if you're looking at an adult population without diabetes, there's about 80% 80, 80 of the cases will come from people with lower risk. The other 20%, those people with higher risk, that a population approach is very important for this group of people, but in terms of people at high risk, um, they need obviously much more targeted things. I mean, one of the simple things recommended, of course, is um, preventing weight gain, but I'm, I'm sure you're so sick of hearing how to prevent diabetes and not necessarily being able to do it. I won't be dis discussing that today. So the question is, what's the best way to prevent cardiovascular disease uh, in people with diabetes? Um, and of course, the obvious answer is start by preventing the diabetes. Um, so there are a number of uh, interventions uh, to prevent diabetes in high-risk subjects. Uh, and the question is, are they the same uh, interventions that will also result in the reduction of cardiovascular risk. And that's something I'm going to talk about over the next few minutes. And they, uh, David Nathan from the US uh, has um, put out this paper, um, which was in Diabetologia, Does Diabetes Prevention Translate into Reduced Long-Term Vascular Complications of Diabetes? And the next couple of uh, slides, etc., will be addressing uh, this particular issue. Um, this slide shows you a number of the different um, <coughs> interventions for the prevention of type 2 diabetes. The Tumulato is Finland, one of the earliest, the US DPP, and all of them get around 58% or so in terms of reducing in IGT subjects um, with different strategies progression to diabetes. What I wanted to talk about first is actually is the Da Qing study in China, because this itself is a very interesting study. And the Da Qing study, um, oh, before I do, I just wanted to mention Yako Tumulato has been a great um, supporter of my work and friend, working in Mauritius as well. And this is the Finnish Diabetes Prevention Study. These are the intervention goals, and the more of these goals that you can achieve, the more likely the intervention will work. And this just shows you, if you look at the intervention in red and the controls in blue, that in the first year of the finished study, there was a successful uh, reduction of the various risk factors. And so the first report of the Finnish intervention showed in terms of people, the intervention group compared with the control group, a 44% risk reduction in new cases of diabetes. Uh, years on, as years go by, 15 years later, were they reminding you that the intervention actually stopped at the six-year point, this difference between the uh, intervention group and the control group persisted, showing the long-term effect of the particular study that was done in Finland. Um, I cannot come to London, to the UK, without mentioning at least the study in progress here, the uh, Healthier You uh, 
uh, NHS Diabetes Prevention Study. I don't have any data of outcomes uh, so far, but from the data published by John Volubchi and his group, that there's been a very successful recruitment of people um, and that it's covering a wide spectrum of the UK population. And I think it'll be very important over the years to know what's the, the story there. Um, looking at Da Ching again, Da Ching, there was a risk reduction of 43% uh, in the first six years of the Da Ching study. It was an intervention which used diet and uh, exercise. The, um, they were able to show that you know, particular effect. And the question then is, would that intervention reduce microvascular or particularly macrovascular, macrovascular complications? And you can see here the, the results of the study. Here's the intervention group at 20 years now um, and uh, the control group. And in that study already, again, you show that with the retinopathy, microvascular complications, uh, a, a significant reduction in retinopathy from the lifestyle intervention. So that looked good at the time, but there were no data on macrovascular. So the study went on and on, and in fact, at 20 years they reported that still they hadn't seen much in terms of the macrovascular effects, but hey, what happened then at 23 years when they examined the data, they were able to show reduced uh, mortality in the intervention group, and indeed they had um, uh, basically mainly cardiovascular uh, mortality per se. So just to move towards uh, the potpourri story, everyone asks, is, is there any population in the world where the uh, prevention um, of diabetes uh, has um, actually shown, or studies, have shown a reduction in the population. And we all know that in World War II there was certainly a fall uh, in diabetes in a number of populations. But I'm just going to mention to you two studies which are very interesting uh, because they, <laughs> you can go out to prevent diabetes. We were going to do it in Western Samoa. We had a big plan for the Western Samoans. And uh, just before we started the study, the biggest cyclone that ever hit Western Samoa came through Western Samoa. And of course, it did the job that we would have been doing with lifestyle and exercise and whatnot. So, you know, so, sometimes you can be lucky or unlucky, whichever way you want to look at it. So, but in Cuba, there was a major economic crisis in Cuba uh, in this period. And at that time, and it's reported in the BMJ, um, there, was there was a decline in diabetes and cardiovascular disease and also um, obesity. Uh, you can see here in the time, this was the time of the economic crisis and you can see that before it and you can see the, the falls in the various parameters and of course you can see the cars that we all like to be able to get into in, in Cuba when, if you can get there. So, Nauru, which I mentioned to you earlier, the highest rate of diabetes in the world, so that was 1975 and the, in the 70s, but Nauru started to have a major economic downturn, and in fact, it was, it was um, only kept alive by Australian money, paying for them to look after boat people that are arriving on the Australian shores and then being shipped off to, um, to uh, Nauru. And if you look at the data here from one of our studies, 1994, look at this age group here, the 44 to 54 year olds. Uh, you can see here prevalence over 50% in that group. A study in 2004, some years after the um, economic problems started. Uh, the same age group it was almost a halving of the actual number of people in the various age groups. Again, an impact of an economic 
and a non-medical intervention. Um, so we're back to the story about um, Nathan, uh, who, who is still very dubious that, in fact, preventing type 2 diabetes, even if you see a reduction in cardiovascular disease, that it's necessarily specifically due to the same intervention strategies you use for type um, 2 diabetes, uh, that may be glucose, while it's important in the diabetes sense, glucose isn't so important in the cardiovascular side, and we may be missing other risk factors to explain why, in fact, there is also a reduction in cardiovascular um, mortality and morbidity, if it actually occurs. Um, and so Nathan looked at two studies mainly, the Da Ching study that I showed you before uh, and, he, and the Stop Nidham study, which was an ACABO study, and both of those actually did show a decrease in CVD and overall mortality during the studies. But he notes that the limited data are promising whether diabetes prevention directly reduces complication-related morbidity and mortality remains unclear. And he calls for longer follow-up of prevention studies and also much more rigorous, rigorous um, analysis of what sort of strategies and interventions one may uh, do. And the interesting here is if we then return to the podium, uh, the late Harry Keane, here from their 1979 Keane and Jarrett report, this preliminary report, this is the Multinational Study of Vascular Disease and Diabetes, this preliminary report confirms and quantifies previous indications that the impact of atherosclerotic disease on persons with diabetes varies considerably between national groups in broad terms running parallel with the variations in prevalence in the populations in general and suggesting that cultural and or ethnic factors are more important determinants of atherosclerosis in diabetic individuals than is the diabetes state itself. So it's still an open book what really the situation here is, and that is like, you know, um, 40 years um, since Harry and uh, John Jarrett uh, raised that issue. So this meeting will be talking about the SGLT2 inhibitors and their importance in the management of diabetes and the prevention of the microvascular complications of diabetes and some effect on obesity. So we always had this story, you know, an apple a day will keep the doctor away. So there are four, I don't know if any of you have seen this yet, has anyone seen this? The four apples that change the world. You know why apples are important? Because a constituent of the SGLT two inhibitors is fluorazin, one of the, and it's also something that's present in apples. And it was one of the first things that was used many years ago to treat type 2 diabetes. So here we go. That's, <laughs> that's the first apple. What do you think the next one is? Any guesses? All right, I beat you. Newton. And the next one, if it comes up, Steve Jobs. <laughs> and the fourth is the apple florizin in the SGLT2 inhibitors. And I, and I claim no conflict with any of the companies in the SGLT2 space. So <coughs> there are some people who even 20 years ago were hopeful that we would reduce cardiovascular complications of type 2 diabetes. To a certain extent, we are doing it, but we're not sure why and how it's happening, and I think it's something that we, we still need to keep on working on. And I want to thank a number of people who have been involved with me uh, in uh, our studies uh, in Mauritius and some of the cardiovascular work, uh, including the late Harry Keane, who was a great inspiration for my own career, uh, and George Alberti, of course, 
who was a former president of this college. Thank you. Thank you.